Um, I'm not really gonna be talking about brain surgery and not even heart surgery, which is what I do, but about something more simple. Uh, some simple lessons that I've learned on my journey in America as an undocumented immigrant. And, uh, but I think there are important lessons Watch that this. I think He's can help you and can help you in your education, can help you to make your I'm own lecture right now. Reality. So on the picture on the left, uh, it's a picture with my grandmothers, uh, my abuelitas. Uh, and I'm there with them because my parents were in America working as undocumented immigrants. And uh, the picture on the right is my first picture actually in America. Uh, 24 hours before that picture was taken, uh, I was on a small boat in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean trying to get into America without uh, documents. Uh, so the lessons that I think are important for today, uh, I think are one is the importance of embra embracing your differences and how uh, it is those things that make you unique, those things that make you different that I think make you stand out and actually can make you a better person and can make you even more successful. The other one is about the importance of believing in yourself. And I think that is not until you begin to believe in yourself that you can actually accomplish some of the things that you wanna accomplish. And the other one is about the importance of doing anything you want to do, whether it's neurosurgery, heart surgery, whatever dreams you have, in small steps and simple steps. And you're going to see this in my own particular uh, journey here in America. So before I start, I just want to ask you to perhaps imagine three things. One is imagine you're in the middle of the ocean. Uh, everything around you is dark. You haven't seen your parents for several years, and you think, you're going to lose your life. What would, what would be going through your own particular mind? Uh, next, imagine you're in America, you made it, you're here, uh, and you're a typical high school teenager. But you know you're different because every day you come home, there's a fear inside your heart that your parents may not be home. Uh, and next, you make it to one of the best universities in the world. Uh, you can feel that you are on, on your way to make your own dreams a reality. And one day you get a letter from the Dean of Foreign Students because she wants to see your green card. The only problem is that you don't have a green card. What will be going through your mind? So today I wanna to share with you what was going through my mind when I faced those uh, obstacles and that reality. And it is really my story, but honestly, it's not just my story. It's the story of millions of immigrants who are here in America uh, working to make it their own particular dreams a reality. And it's not just their story either. This is really the story of America. It is the story of the pilgrims who came here uh, first uh, to America. It is the story of all the immigrants that came here from Italy, from, from uh, uh, Europe, uh, who came here you know, without documents. So it is the story of America. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who come here to make their own dreams a reality. So we're going to be talking about that as well. Before I start, I just want to tell you about my why, uh, and that pertains to my family. And I think all of you need to examine sometimes why you're doing what you're doing, why you're going through so many years of education, why you want to make your own dreams and make all these things that you're, you're, you're working for. And for me, it's my family. Uh, my wife is here on the left side, uh, who has been with me through the good times and the bad times. And my daughter, who's now studying to be a journalist at Columbia School of Journalism. And actually, when my daughter was about 12 years old, she drew up this poster because she knew that her father was perhaps a little bit different than the other uh, fathers in her school of her friends. Uh, one, because I had a heavy accent, which I, I still have. So she put this poster where she put that this man is wanted. He has a big Spanish accent. Uh, accused of torturing little kids to practice piano and guitar and confiscating their toys. Uh, and she put help make America safe by finding this man. Uh, and then my son, uh, who's a sweet little kid. And when he was about this age, um, one day we're having a conversation, father to son, and he looked up at me and he said, dad, dad, you have the best job in the world. Because when you're stressed out, you can just get a knife and a saw and you can just cut into people's chests. So I said to my son, wait, wait, hold on, Brandon. Uh, you're right, that is what I do. 
And actually, you know, during those days, we, we were kind of concerned because my son was really into uh, like each Halloween, he always wanted to be the evil character. He never wanted to be the good person. He, like for Batman, he didn't want to be Batman. He wanted to be the Joker. Uh, he wanted to be the Black Spider-Man. Always sort of uh, wanted to be the, the, the evil character. So I took this opportunity to let him know why I did what I did. And I told him that uh, I, I am a heart surgeon. I literally I, I have the opportunity every day to get into the chest of my patients with a knife and a saw, but I don't do it out of stress. I do it to fix the arteries that are blocked and to fix the valves that are not working and to fix other problems within the heart. Uh, this was the dream that I had from the time I was a little kid growing up in a small and humble town in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, and it was a dream that was made possible when I had this incredible opportunity to come uh, to America. You see, I grew up in a small town in Medellin, Colombia called Barrio Antioquia, which uh, for many years was the epicenter of the war between Pablo Escobar and the government. And uh, I was surrounded by the love of my grandmothers and other people in the block where I grew up, very tight uh, community uh, with a lot of love. But don't get me wrong, also surrounded by incredible violence. Uh, and on the same streets where I grew up playing soccer every day until it was so dark that you couldn't even see the soccer ball, I saw some of my friends get uh, killed. And in fact, this is a picture here of my uh, little cousin who was like our own little sister uh, when she was just a little baby. And this is a picture of her when she was 12, uh, just a few months before she was gone down right on the same streets where I used to play soccer. And that also happened to our best friend here, Marlon, who also had the same fate growing up in the same neighborhood and the same streets where I used to play soccer all the time. And in fact, uh, this is why people come to the United States to look for a better life, to look for dignity, to look for safety. And this is a picture of my father working in a factory in Brooklyn. Um, and they came here to be, uh, to work for opportunity, for dignity, uh, not to be bad hombres or, or mujeres. Um, and that's what they found. They found safety, they loved America, uh, but the family was separated. Uh, my parents were here and uh, me and my brother were back in Colombia with my uh, abuelitas. And my mother was uh, suffering. My mother would cry every day. She would cry in the morning whenever she woke up. She would cry in the middle of the day and she would cry every night. Uh, in fact, during those nights, during those days, there was a commercial that would come on TV and ask the viewers, have you seen your kids tonight? And this commercial would just tear my mother to tears every single night. So in an act of desperation, uh, my parents made arrangements so that me at the age of 13 and my brother at the age of 11 could be smuggled into the United States. My mother was promised that we would be here in three days. And uh, this was not the case, unfortunately. Because two weeks later, we found ourselves stranded on a tiny island in the Bahamas called Bimini. It's the closest island in the Bahamas uh, to Florida. We were waiting there for a boat to pick us up and bring us to Miami. And finally, after two weeks of waiting and waiting for the conditions to be better, uh, we left on October 26 at midnight, October 26 of 1978 uh, at midnight so that we wouldn't be detected by the American Coast Guard. Uh, initially, the conditions appeared to be calm, but in the middle of the sea, they weren't calm. Uh, it only took seven hours, but I can tell you it was the longest seven hours of my life. Everyone thought that we were going to die. Uh, I still remember the sound of the boat going up into the air and then coming down, crashing against the waves. Everyone was praying. And at that moment, what was going through my mind was not sort of praying to be able to enjoy the opportunities that my parents had promised us in America. But I was just begging the Lord for one more second so that I could see my mother again, so that I could feel her warmth and touch her face and just be able to see her one more time. And this is what I meant when I talked about simple things and how simple things are some of the most important uh, and most powerful forces that can make you do things. 
And that's what I was thinking about when I thought that we weren't gonna make it. Fortunately, we made it to Miami where we met friends of my parents who uh, that night put us up on a flight that brought us uh, to New York where we met our parents. Uh, now, they told us that the trip was not over yet. They told us that when we met our parents in the airport that we had to uh, pretend that this was, the re this was just a regular meeting that we were there just uh, maybe perhaps uh, we had been on vacation that we couldn't over celebrate. And we thought it was gonna be easy, but I still remember walking down the corridor to meet our parents. And out of the corner of my eye, I see that my mother is crying. And then I see my father and he's also crying. And when I saw my father crying, we just broke down and we started running towards them. We started hugging, we started celebrating right in the middle of the airport floor. I can tell you that if immigration had been there, they probably thought that this was very abnormal. In any case, uh, that was our first night in America, which was incredible. I mean, the, I remember the ride to our house, to our apartment. Uh, it was just so special because, you know, sometimes we get used to all the things that we see here in America. We don't really appreciate them as much, but that first night, uh, looking at all the lights, all the cars, uh, the bridges, the skyscrapers, everything just seems so incredible. But what caught my attention that night was something even more simple. That night, my mother was sort of showing us our tiny apartment and she opened, opened up the refrigerator. And right in the middle of the refrigerator, there was a little basket with apples, green apples, red apples. And uh, she told us that we could have anything in that refrigerator. But the apples were important to us because in Colombia, when my abuelitas bought an apple, you would never get a whole apple. You would get a little wedge. She would cut it into little wedges and you would just get one little wedge. And if you had been good, you could get two wedges, but not an entire apple. And uh, so that night we went to sleep and we actually couldn't fall asleep. And uh, we got up and woke up my mother and we asked her if we could get an apple. And uh, this really made her very emotional. She started crying because she realized that we were together physically again, uh, but that we needed to do a lot of work to come together as a family. And this was evident during our first few weeks and months, and maybe even the first year in America, uh, because it's not easy when you're 13 years old and you come into a new country not knowing the language without any friends into a completely new system. Uh, other kids would call us refugees and they would tell us to go back to our own country. They would make fun of our accents. They would make fun each time we try to speak the new language. Uh, so much so that we were both getting into fights almost every week uh, to the point where the principal called my mother and asked her for a special meeting because we were going to be suspended from school. And I still remember that meeting because my mother broke down crying. And uh, I decided right then and there that I had to do something different to change my life around. So the question is, how do you change your life around when you're a young teenager in a new country and there are so many obstacles and adversity. And this is what I talked about, tiny, simple steps. And my tiny little step at that point was to find a job uh, delivering the newspaper. And I actually, I, I had problems convincing my father because he always felt that if I got a job that I forget about uh, school. Uh, so I told him that if my grades didn't improve uh, that I would just quit the job and I would just concentrate on school. But when I decided to get this job delivering the newspaper, I decided right then and there that I wasn't just gonna go through the motions of delivering the newspaper. I decided that I was gonna be the best newspaper delivery boy in America. That no one was gonna be better than me at delivering the newspaper. And that's what I did. I delivered the paper. I got up at 4.30 in the morning uh, every day to deliver the newspaper, whether it was raining, snowing, whether I was sick or had a fever, I always deliver the newspaper. And guess what? It worked because after about a year of delivering the newspaper, I was selected as the newspaper carrier of the month. And this was, this was really incredible. Uh, my my uh, name came out on the, on the newspaper, Harold Fernandez, carrier of the month. 
Um, my father was really proud. He cut out that paper article and put it by his locker and showed all his coworkers. Uh, my mother cut it out and, and put it in her purse and she would stop everyone on the street, even people she didn't know uh, and tell them, look, 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 my son, newspaper carrier of the month. So to me, this gave me that initial rush of energy at the idea that I had done something positive, something good that I could do little things that were positive in America. And I'm sure many of you are probably thinking, well, you know, that's Fernandez, newspaper carrier of the month. It doesn't really translate into much. What, what does it really mean? But I can tell you that the same energy, the same enthusiasm, the same mindset that I used to uh, become the newspaper carrier of the month is exactly what I did in all my other activities, whether it was in the Boy Scouts to become an Eagle Scout, uh, whether it was in track and field to become one of the best runners in my high school, uh, or whether it was uh, at uh, Princeton doing uh, in, in the soccer team or getting into medical school. Uh, it was the same tiny little steps and the same mindset that I used to be the newspaper career of the month. So uh, I made it uh, to Princeton. Uh, which was one of my dreams to be able to go to the school because I had read so many things about Albert Einstein. And there I found myself having many doubts, uh, thinking that I didn't fit in. Um, the school of uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald in the novel, This Side of Paradise, where the main protagonist, Amory Blaine, feels not confident because he feels that he's from the middle class, uh, even though he was raised in the high points of society, uh, having read all the classics by the time he was a teenager, uh, listening to classical music. And there I was, Harold Fernandez, uh, an immigrant from Colombia at the same school uh, as F. Scott uh, Fitzgerald. Uh, my music was not uh, Beethoven or uh, Mozart. My music was the music of uh, Colombia, the music that spoke about prison, about uh, rebellion, uh, songs from Hector Lavoe, like Calle Luna, Calle Sol, uh, which talks about a typical town in Latin America. Songs like El Preso, which talks about uh, prison. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, this song so well because that's how I learned to dance to this kind of music, which actually talks about being locked up in the four corners of a prison. And I use that energy to be fanatic about molecular biology at Princeton. So that my room at Princeton was adorned with molecules of pictures of molecular biology. And I decided that I was gonna do the same thing in molecular biology that I did delivering the newspaper, that I was gonna be the best molecular biologist in America. And I worked really hard at doing this at Princeton University. And it worked because after I had been there for about a year and a half, I received a letter from the Dean of uh, Students saying that my grades at Princeton were the highest grades in the entire university. Uh, unfortunately, about two weeks later, I received another letter, this time from the Dean of Foreign Students, and she wanted to see my green card. The only problem was that I didn't have a green card. In fact, I had used a fake green card on my application to Princeton and also a fake social security card because there was no other way that I could apply and fill out my application. So when I received this news, I found a friend, uh, Professor Arcadio Diaz Quinones, uh, who's here on your left side, a uh, professor from Puerto Rico who taught Spanish literature at Princeton. And I spoke with him and he spoke uh, to Professor Bowen, who's in the middle right here, who was the 17th president of Princeton University and told them my story, told them uh, the problem that I was facing. And that same night, uh, Professor Bowen, then the pr president of Princeton, told my professor, uh, Arcadio Diaz Quinones, that I could stay at Princeton. So basically Princeton was going to change all my papers and documents so that as far as they were concerned, I was a foreign student and not a student living in New Jersey. And this allowed me to finish my education at Princeton. At the same time, I had been writing letters to everyone I knew, 
So I wrote letters to uh, President Reagan at that time, asking for a letter of support. And he sent me a letter. I wrote letters to the governor of New Jersey, uh, Thomas Kane, who also sent me a letter. And also to Bill Bradley, who at that time was the senator of uh, New Jersey, who was also a Princeton grad. And he also sent me a letter of support. But not only did he send me a letter of support, but he actually had me call his office because he wanted to know who was the judge in immigration that was handling our case. And I called his office. And the next time we had a meeting with our judge, actually my entire family was given a green card and residency to be in the United States of America. And this allowed me the opportunity to finish my education at Princeton. Uh, when I graduated, I received a prize, which is the Moses Taylor Pine Honor Prize, which is the highest prize that is given to an undergraduate student. Uh, I wasn't the first Latino to win that prize. In fact, the first Latino was actually a Latina uh, who's now one of the Supreme Court justices uh, uh, who I've had the opportunity to meet, uh, the Honorable Sonia Sotomayor, who's a wonderful person. And uh, she uh, also uh, shared the same prize. So I want to sort of tell you about three lessons. Uh, and these are three lessons that I learned not from uh, my time at Princeton or at Harvard or at MIT, but three lessons that I learned from some of the most uh, humble people that I've ever known. And that's my abuelita Rosa and my abuelita Alicia. And these are three important lessons that I think can help you in anything that you wanna do in your life. The first one is the power of an education. And obviously an education is what allowed me to go from the violence in the streets of Medellin, Colombia to becoming a heart surgeon and to now having written two books. Uh, my latest book is called A Boy and a Book. And it talks about the uh, magic and, and how through the power of reading and the power of books, you can overcome all obstacles. But an education, the way I see it, is not just the power to go to medical school or to go to business school or law school or, or college, but it's really to be able to read and be able to do it with an open, mind and an open heart. So that when you read, uh, you, you're looking for things to change who you are and to change the way you feel. And actually even more recently, I, this happened to me about five years ago that I started looking at all the literature about nutrition, for example, and, and how and the best optimal nutrition for a, a heart healthy diet. And I started uh, and I changed how I ate. And so, so now, uh, I eat whole food, plant-based nutrition, uh, a vegan diet. And it was because I started reading and, and I started doing it with an open mind and an open heart. Uh, the second one is the power of a smile. Uh, and I always tell people that when you go for an interview or when you meet somebody, uh, they always talk about the importance of a handshake, um, but even more important than that is a power uh, of a smile. Because a smile tells other people that you are going to have a positive mindset whenever you face challenges, whenever you face obstacles, that you are going to look for solutions instead of uh, for excuses and for other obstacles. And the third one is the power of caring. Uh, in this letter that my grandmother sent me when I was here, she tells me that she thought that I was gonna be a good physician because I cared. Uh, and she was right because I do. And that is one of the reasons that I enjoy medicine and surgery so much. In fact, one of my favorite quotes in medicine is from one of the deans at Harvard, Francis Weld Peabody, who said that the secret in the care of the patient is to care for the patient. This is also what makes our CEO at Northwell uh, such a good person and such a good leader that he cares. And I think people will follow you more because they think that you care before following you because they think that you know what you're doing. So this is one of the lessons that I learned from my abuelitas. When I give talks to students, I like to talk about dreams, passion and sacrifice. Uh, and you know, dreams are things that are hard to describe. Uh, these are things that are in your heart. Uh, they don't come from your parents, from your friends, but these are the things that keep you awake at night uh, so that uh, you, you, you know that these are the things that you want to perform in your life. Uh, passion is not, uh, I don't like to describe it, but I like to paint a picture of passion. And to me, passion is what a young boy or girl feels 
for example, when they're growing up in the favelas of Brazil or, or Colombia, and they know they want to be soccer players. Uh, these kids play soccer all the time. Uh, they don't make any excuses. If they don't have a soccer ball, they go out and they make their own soccer ball. If they don't have shoes, they don't uh, tell their parents, well, I can't play soccer because I don't have shoes. They go out and play without shoes. Uh, the same thing happens with the kids in Kenya or uh, Ethiopia who want to be runners and who are running all the time. Uh, the same thing happens with an education. Uh, so that I tell kids, if they ask you to read a book once, you don't read the book once, you read the book two times, three times, as many times as you need to be able to know everything which is in that book. And the same thing happens if you want to be a surgeon. So for example, in terms of heart surgery, which is a very technical field, uh, when I realized that I wanted to be a surgeon, I was always doing knots everywhere. And I always had a needle holder in my hands, in my pocket, in my uh, coat pocket. And I always had the needle holder and I would pretend in my mind that I was going through some of the surgical steps of that particular surgery. But that's what's required for you to be the best person that you can be. And that's the passion that you need uh, in terms of becoming the best that you can be. And the other one is sacrifice. And sacrifice really in my mind means that you can't do it all. Uh, so that if you're a, a high school, student, for example, and you know you have your SATs on a Saturday morning and the Friday night they ask you to go to your, to your friend's birthday party, you should be able to tell them no, because the next day you have something which is more important. And this is going to happen many, many times during your lifetime where you are going to have to say no to some of the things that can get in your way. Now, uh, I always like to leave you with my own studying routine and how I, I used to study at Princeton and at Harvard. And it basically involves three steps. Uh, the first step is, uh, and I, you know, I call it physical learning, but the first step is to be prepared. Uh, and now with uh, the internet and websites like the Khan Academy where you can go and basically find a video on almost anything out there. Uh, you know, and I do it today in, in surgeries, for example. There are so many surgical procedures where you can just go on the internet and find little videos of people who have done them before or people who have done them a little bit differently. And it's a way for people to be prepared. And it just makes such a big difference. If you go into a lecture and you know at least a little bit in terms of what the lecture is gonna be about. So that's what I mean by being prepared. The other one, which I think is really important, which I used to do at Princeton all the time is called physical learning which is that when I would sit down with a book, I wouldn't read more than one or two pages in one sitting. I would read one or two pages at most. Then I would literally get up and walk around the room and review stuff in my head. And, and there's actually a lot of evidence now that shows that the act of moving up and getting up and that physical activity actually creates uh, the hormonal changes that make you learn even better. So that's why I call it physical learning. And the third step, which is the most important part, is what I call teaching a friend. Um, because if you can teach someone else, it means that you really know it. And at Princeton, for example, if I didn't have a friend or if I wasn't studying with anyone, I would find a room, I would find a board with chalk and I would pretend that I was teaching that particular lesson to someone else and that they were actually asking me questions and I was trying to answer those questions. So these are the three steps that I can guarantee you will make you a much better student in your, in your career and in medical school and, and then whatever other uh, endeavors you have. And now I wanna tell you about three uh, people that, that three achievements that I exemplify some of the concepts that I talked about before. Uh, this is a picture in May of 1954. Uh, this is uh, Roger Bannister. Uh, before May of 1954, no human had ever run the mile under four minutes. Uh, and there were two runners that were very close, uh, Roger Bannister and John Landis. In fact, John Landis was a much better runner uh, from Australia, but uh, John Landis stopped believing in himself. In fact, he was recorded as saying that there's no way that I can do this because every time I get so close to the four minute mark, I hit a wall. And therefore the first person who broke the four minute mark was Roger Bannister, who happened to be a medical student 
uh, and, and he did it because his coach really got into his head and made him believe that he could do it. And in fact, the next time they raced together, John Landis beat him by three seconds. And the next year, 17 people broke four minutes. And it was because people started believing that they could break the four minute mark. The other person is Diane Nyad, who accomplished an incredible feat. Uh, she was the first human to ever be able to swim from Cuba to the coast of uh, Florida. Uh, and Diane Nyad did it not when she was 20 years old, not when she was 30 years old, she did it when she was 65 years old. And she did it not on her first attempt, not on her second attempt, she did it on her fifth attempt. And when she got out of the water, she said three things that I hope you can remember. The first one is that um, it takes, uh, you know, to never ever give up. And obviously she never gave up. You know, she tried and tried and on her fifth attempt, she was able to do it. The second one was that you're never too old to make your dreams a reality. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, people accomplish their dreams when they're in their 30s, 40s, 50s, you're never too old to make your dreams a reality. And the third one, which I think is the most important one, is that this may look like a lonely, lonely sport. You know, she was there on the water by herself, but it is not, it requires a team. And everything you do in your life is going to require a team. It's going to require a community of people. It's going to require friends. It's going to require family. Uh, even if it's just to enjoy some of the things that you want to do, it's always going to require a team. And the last one is one of my favorite people of all time that I hope you can see in the Olympics uh, this summer, uh, Eliud Kipchoge, uh, who was the first person to break the uh, two hour mark in the marathon. And he just did it uh, last year in October. Uh, and he uh, really exemplifies this concept of no human is limited. Uh, and the idea that through simple steps, it is those simple steps that keep you free that keep you being able to accomplish those things that you want to accomplish. And with that, I'm, I'm going to open up the floor to questions, but obviously this journey to me has been just uh, so rewarding and so incredible uh, to be able to come from a small town in Colombia and now to be able to perform open heart surgery in the greatest country in, in the world. So it's been an incredible journey and it was all made possible through this opportunity to come to America and through small steps and small changes in my life. Thank you so much, Dr. Fernandez. That is an incredible oh, story. And there was so much helpful advice in there too about like how to live, how to learn. Um, that was incredible. Um, really, really Thank you. happy to have you. Thanks, Ashley. Of course. Did you want to say something, Dr. Linger, or should we open it up? <clears throat> what do you think? Yeah, I don't know if I can. I'm just. It's uh, just hearing that's pretty, pretty, pretty powerful. So let let the. I'm sure that people have questions. So um, why don't you why don't you why don't you spring the questions on Harold? Yeah, sure. Thanks, David. Right now it's spamming with uh, <laughs> with thank yous and stuff like that. Um, Okay, this is. I, like I have a. I only have one question. This, as a parent, you know, you know, obviously, I think coming in 1978 uh, is different than the world is now. I, I know that the relationship of the country has changed, and our and our understanding of uh, of immigration and, and and it's become such a big part of, uh, you know, what the the political discourse and stuff like that. You know, with your kids, how do you uh, filter? this as an adult. No, I know they know where you came from, but I'm sure that they've had a very different life than you did. They, they can't possibly um, feel the, 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 what they, you, you've, you've made the sacrifice for them in some ways. I mean, how do you talk to your children about what's going on right now? And how do you keep them, their heads on straight that uh, it's all going to be okay? Yeah. Uh, you know, my daughter actually hadn't read my book until just a few years ago. And when she was in her senior year at the University of Richmond, she read my book, Undocumented, uh, and it really, she was really emotional about it. Uh, so she uh, almost cried with every 
single page. And, and I think it really exemplifies, you know, the struggles that immigrants have here in America and that separation between parents and kids. I mean, having my own kids, uh, and especially when they were small, uh, I think it's just so hard to be separated uh, from, from your kids. And, you know, when I see these pictures of kids being separated from their parents uh, in different parts of, of our country, I think it's really something that I think most people feel very emotional about. Um, and uh, I just try to sort of just be honest with them and, and, and be transparent. Uh, I know that the topic of immigration is a really difficult one and challenging one, but I think that if we look at it from the humanistic side, I think we should be able to find solutions. You know, I still feel that America is the most compassionate country in the world. Uh, and that's what allowed me to really be able to uh, become uh, an American citizen, uh, that I had people that were able to help me. Uh, but if you think about it, you know, when I started writing letters, I wasn't thinking about whether people were Democrats or Republicans. I wrote a letter, I wrote a letter to uh, the uh, Republican president and to the Republican governor of New Jersey without even thinking that uh, they were gonna think that, oh no, I'm a Republican, I can't, uh, I can't help you. Uh, I think that when people, in, in general, when Americans see that people are here and that they wanna uh, be part of the United States, I think people in general are able to open up their, their heart and their minds to look for solutions. And, and that's what I think that needs to happen right now. You know, I think we forget uh, every single one of us in the United States had some parent that made a decision uh, to leave. And as the, as the generations go on, we get disconnected from that. You know, uh, the only people that were here first were essentially the Indians. Yeah. And, uh, you know, every single person in this country had a, had a, had a it's usually a war or danger, you know, in your case is probably a combination of drugs and lack of opportunity, obviously, but, you know, the people leave because of, of, of conflict. And so we're all kind of here because of some conflict where our parents or our grandparents or our great grandparents or whatever sensed danger and then took this huge risk. Um, so we're all basically here on the shoulders of, of, of immigrants, um, no matter what family we're from. And it's just yeah. an important thing to remember. Just our kids, as you get moved further along, uh, they, they, you forget that. And so yeah. I think that's important to rem remind everyone. That's right. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Um, yeah. I, uh, there's a question here. Um, what advice would you give to first-generation students with immigrant parents who are trying to pursue medicine but do not have much guidance? Yeah, so the, um, you know, I spoke about the idea of making sure that what makes you different is what makes you better. So for example, when I greet and meet my patients, there are things that I do that come from my sort of background and the way I was raised by my grandmothers. For example, I always need to make some physical contact. So I always hold their hand uh, and uh, greet them with a smile. Uh, and I make that connection. And, uh, you know, and some of the things that I do, for example, I always try to use a little uh, humor. So for example, when I see my patients after open heart surgery, I always have my stethoscope and I listen to their heart. And I, Hey, Harold, if you, st if, you could, if you could stop sharing your screen, you think the kids would see your whole face rather than just okay, your talk. Great. Just stop sharing and then you'll be full screen. There you go. Okay, great. So I, I always uh, put my stethoscope on and I listen to the heart and I always make a little joke about, um, I, I'm going to listen to your heart just to make sure that it's still here in, in your chest. And everyone, that always gives them a little smile. And so we make that little connection and that I think is important. And these are little things that I think uh, make you unique and, and things that I think make you even uh, better. Uh, so, so that's the one thing that I would tell all kids, just to make sure that you continue uh, with your uh, work, continue uh, you know, making sure that you're proud of your culture, that you're proud of your heritage, you're proud of all the things that have uh, uh, made you different 
and use the use those things as a strength, embrace them and, and, and make them better. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think one of the most impressive things about you is just like how you can maintain such positivity, like despite everything. Um, and I think that's really, really unique and special to be able to have like a good attitude, um, even when things are really hard. Do you think that that's something you've like kind of always been like a very like positive thinker looking forward to like what's good or is it something that you like learn to do because I think like it's just really hard I feel like sometimes to not let like negativity overwhelm you um so how do you go about just like creating such a positive atmosphere yeah I, th I think that's a great point uh Ashley and uh you know, especially as it relates to immigration, for example, but you can sort of uh, extrapolate to other areas. Uh, there were so many kids that during the last administration, you know, the dreamers, I'm sure you, you've heard about, uh, who didn't know what was going to happen. And they never knew whether they should even stay in school. And I would tell them that one of the things they have to do is to be able to find the strength and the energy to just concentrate in, in that one thing that they can change because there are gonna be so many other things you can't do anything about, things that you can't change. So you can't change the immigration system, you can't change the laws, but the one thing you can change is how you do in school. So for example, when I was going through my problems with immigration, I would always go, because you know sometimes when you go to this uh, immigration interviews, you basically spend all day in the immigration building. And I didn't want to waste my whole day over there. So I would bring all my books and I would sit, I would sit, sit down somewhere in, the, in, a, in a corner reading organic chemistry while I was waiting for my name to be called up. And that's how I was able to escape a lot of, a lot of the other reality of what was going in my life. Because I could have said, well, you know, why am I going to study if I don't have a green card, if I don't have a social security card, if I'm not gonna be able to get into college, but I close my eyes to all those negative things and I put them on the side and I just concentrate on the one thing that I could change. And that was an education because that's the one thing that's accessible to everyone. You know, reading books that people can't deny you. They can't take that away from you. And, and that's the way I was able to sort of put away all the other things that I couldn't change. But the one thing I could change is what I decided to focus on. And I, you know, the, the reason I share my story about the newspaper job that I had was that that was something physical, something easy to do, but something that I decided to do really well. And it was just, you know, it wasn't something that I invented. You know, this is what I would see in my house. This is what I would see my father do every day getting up you know, early in the morning to go and work 12, 14 hours. And this is what I saw also in my community. This is what I saw in the Hispanic community, all the people working in the farms, picking up the vegetables and the, the fruits and, you know, people doing their job with, with honesty, with integrity and, and a desire to do the best possible job that they could. And that's why I decided that I was going to do the same thing delivering the newspaper. I love that that's how your journey starts out because I think people have, especially now, get really caught up in doing like this thing and that because it looks good on their resume and like they have to have these experiences. But the reality is, is like you just need to do a great job at anything you do. And like, exactly. there's there's no like unimportant job. Like, like you did go into medicine, which is notorious for like a way to be able to help people every day. But like you can help people in any job. It's, yep. it's kind of just all about like your attitude. Um, um, this, this is a pretty, I feel like emotional question. Um, but if you feel comfortable answering, yeah. like how, how did you deal with and how do you continue to deal with all of the discrimination against immigrants? Like how, like, do you like put away the noise? Like, or what, what do you do? It sounds like you've talked to other people who have reached out to you for help. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's a great question. And, 
In fact, when my story first came out in the, in the New York Times, which is a pretty liberal publication, uh, about at least probably somewhere between 50 to 60% of the comments were negative uh, because there are going to be many people who feel that you come here as an immigrant means that you stole someone's position uh, at Princeton or at Harvard and that that position should have gone to someone who was born here or to someone who has been here longer or someone who came here legally. And there's no way, there's nothing you can do to change their minds. And I, I've been told this right on, on my face when I give talks uh, and, and I tell them that there's nothing that I can do to change their mind. Uh, what I can do, however, is just do the best job that I can doing what I do and that's taking care of patients. And uh, I feel that that pushes me even a little bit more to do the best job that I can and to stay on top of my job and my profession to do the best job that I can. And that's the only thing you can change, the only thing you can do. Uh, there are gonna be many people out there who you're not gonna be able to change their mind. That's really powerful. I think it's really hard to accept that there are people who you can't convince otherwise, yeah. especially when it's something like just a, like being human, like, and that's, that's really hard to cope with. But the reality is it's how things are. And like, you just have to do you and <laughs> have the people who support you. Um, that's right. And I think we've been so lucky to have you here. Um, I think a ton of people have resonated with your story. Um, I know that you are very, very busy and <laughs> we appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been an honor and uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, you know, I, I still think that uh, medicine and, and in general is, is one of the most noble professions uh, everywhere. Uh, and it uh, just provides so many opportunities and for growth and for development. And, and uh, I wouldn't have done anything else. That's amazing. I love Aaron, thank you. Thank, thank you so much for joining us. This is really, really meaningful. And I look forward to catch up with you soon. You're amazing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Take care, buddy. Thanks, Ashley. Okay. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.